Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an uh, introduction into the Bitcoin blockchain. Bitcoin in the Bitcoin S with the short name BTC, not the one you have here, Bitcoin Cash. No, that one is not. <laughs> um, so that's the first Bitcoin, the first blockchain that's ha that has been um, born into this world, let's say it that way. And um, today I'm going to show you uh, the basics of Bitcoin and also how you can earn a little bit of Bitcoin maybe and how to use it with which wallets and how to safely store it. How many of you have uh, already used Bitcoin? Uh, has a wallet? You? One? Two? Okay, so fine. <laughs> it's good to know. <laughs> Okay, so let's first, let I want to introduce myself. As Allah said, my name is Anita. I, uh, I'm a Bitcoin podcaster. So I do interviews with the people who are the developers and CEOs and company founders in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And my goal is to educate people like newbies who come into the crypto space, uh, how to safely use and earn Bitcoin. Um, I'm also a member of Bitcoin Austria. This is something, it's like an uh, NGO, it's like the Satoshi Center here, where we educate people on Bitcoin. And I'm also the translator of uh, those two books by Andreas Antonopoulos. They are called The Internet of Money. I translated them to German. And I also wrote a beginner's book for Bitcoiners, but also now just in German, but I want to um, translate that to English this year. So where do I come from? I come from Austria, that is in Europe here uh, in Vienna. I live in Vienna. Uh, Austria is uh, next to a country called Germany. It's not Australia. Many people mistake uh, Austria for Australia. We are actually a very small country. We have 8 million inhabitants. It's like four times the size of Botswana, I think. And in Vienna, we have around 2 million inhabitants. So why am I here? Um, because Allah invited me to come and I also uh, stopped by in Zimbabwe. I have been to Zimbabwe in the last two and, a, in two and a half years. Why? Because many people in the Bitcoin space in the so-called Western world are talking about use cases for Bitcoin. And it always Zimbabwe and Venezuela pop up because of the hyperinflation there. And I was curious, I wanted to go and see if this is really true, if people really use Bitcoin and if not, what are the obstacles? Because we don't know, you know, I, I'm here to learn from you. And my goal is then to present these findings at conferences. I will be in San Francisco, San Francisco this um, end of uh, March. There's the Bitcoin 2020 conference. And I will also visit other conferences and tell the people outside of Africa what would be needed that you can adopt Bitcoin more easily. That's why I'm here. And two weeks ago, there was a meetup in Harare at the Impact Hub Harare. And I did basically uh, quite the same talk there and showed them the same things as you will see now. Uh, I have to thank my sponsors to be able to be here. And that's local bitcoins. And I was told yesterday by Allah that local bitcoins are suspended um, users from Botswana, sadly. I think that's due to new regulations by the European Union. Uh, I hope uh, you can use that again. Then uh, it's what Bitcoin did. This is also a podcast. It's a colleague of mine. He also does great podcast interviews where you can learn a lot. And Shift Crypto Security. Um, which is a hardware manufacturer and I have one of those here and I will give it away then after this talk we do a little quiz I've got some questions for you and you can win that and the second uh, wallet provider manufacturer is called card wallet these are I will explain it later and you also can win it today and then uh, I have support from a company called Gotenna. They are doing mesh networks. And with a mesh network, you could the theoretically and also practica practically also send Bitcoin without having an internet connection. And then Team Satoshi, Team Satoshi are friends of mine. We are a sports club, a decentralized sports club doing 
um, sports events in the name or, or in honor of Satoshi Nakamoto, the founder of Bitcoin. So I'm going to show you how you might be able to earn Bitcoin and what Bitcoin is. Let's start with the basics. What is Bitcoin? In 2008, uh, somebody published a so-called white paper on the website bitcoin.org. You can download it there, you can read it. It's basically the basis of the Bitcoin blockchain, how it's laid out, and uh, also the basis of all the other cryptocurrencies that there are around now. And um, on January the 3rd, in 2009, the first public block of the Bitcoin blockchain was mined meaning that was the birth of the Bitcoin blockchain. And as you can see, the name is Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, meaning that the person, or maybe a group of people, we don't know who it is, it's called he, she, they, it's called Satoshi Nakamoto, um, was the first person to be able to solve a problem, the so-called double spending problem, meaning the idea was to have money for the internet. It was uh, in 2008, as I said before, there was the big financial crisis all around the world, also in Zimbabwe. And um, the inventor thought it would be great to have a money that is not able to be interfered by the banks. So to have a, a independent money that doesn't need intermediaries like banks. Uh, and um, that means that it's possible to send money now without sending it over many, many intermediaries like banks, like we have it on the left side, uh, where you see if you buy something online, I'm not, I'm not sure if you can use PayPal here, but you can use your credit card, I guess, and then, so the payment goes from the PayPal to the credit card company, from the cat credit card company to your bank, and then to the other bank, and then the merchant gets your money. And with Bitcoin, you only have you and me and nothing in between, only the, the network, the Bitcoin network. You don't need anybody to trust in between. And uh, that was the solution that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto found because there were many other projects before, so Bitcoin didn't come out of nothing. There were many, many other um, uh, attempts to build digital money that can't be interfered and cannot be counterfeited. And uh, Satoshi Nakamoto was actually the first one uh, who combined all the knowledge that was uh, built up from the 90s up until 2008 and combined them in a genius way together so it's not possible to counterfeit uh, Bitcoin or uh, to transact a kind of a, a, a amount of Bitcoin two times, so you cannot double spend. You cannot send the Bitcoin to someone and then you send it to someone else. Like with a PDF, for instance, you can copy it as often as you want at no cost and send it to people. So if this is a money, it's n it doesn't have any worth. So that's what Satoshi Nakamoto was able to um, solve this problem. Um, what I think is very important to know is or are the properties of the Bitcoin blockchain, because with, if you know these, then you can decide on whether other cryptocurrencies or other blockchain projects do make sense for you. If they are um, good projects or, and not scams, you know, there are, I know that there have been a lot of scams around and a lot of ICOs where many people lost money. So if you look at these values and, uh, uh, yes, um, how's it called, properties, uh, then you might decide on your own or can decide on your own. Um, the first one is Bitcoin is an open platform. So everybody can use it. There is no, you don't have to show somebody your ID. You don't have to tell your name or your address. You can just use it. It's frictionless. It's public, meaning it's transparent. Every developer can look into the code can uh, look if everything is working, if everything is co correct. Um, it's neutral. So Bitcoin doesn't decide if your transaction is a good transaction or a bad transaction. So nobody can say uh, you're not allowed to send this money outside the country, you're not allowed to pay for I don't know what, you know? 
So nobody can interfere with your payment. The Bitcoin blockchain uh, works on consensus rules, meaning there's no single entity and also not many entities that can interfere with the basics of the software protocol. There always has to be a common decision about the future of the Bitcoin blockchain. For instance, if the, there's need to uh, change something in the software code, then all the people who are using Bitcoin in a way, the Bitcoin, the pool nodes, the, uh, the miners, they have to decide on which software they use. That's, for instance, what happened uh, with the Bitcoin blockchain one or two years ago. There was a so-called hard fork. So if miners and pool nodes decide they want to run the new software, because like, for instance, with B, uh, Bitcoin Cash, this thing you have here, the, the flyers, the guys thought, we want to do something else. We want to change the code. So the other miners and nodes didn't want to change the code. And that's when a so-called hard fork happens. The Bitcoin blo blockchain splits in two forks. The one is BTC and the other one is BCH, for instance. So it's not the same anymore, basically. And but if we all would say we love BCH, then nobody would use BTC anymore. So it's a free decision. We decide what we want to follow, which form of software with which in, uh, rules in it. It's censorship resistant, as I said before, nobody can interfere. The government cannot take away your money. And it's decentralized, meaning that there is no central entity, like for instance with Facebook, Google, Twitter. These are centralized entities, organizations, who decide on how Twitter looks, how WhatsApp is working. But nobody, no single entity can decide on that in Bitcoin, in the Bitcoin blockchain. And of course it's borderli borderless. It's a global money, it's a global system to send values from here to your friends in Nigeria, to Australia, to Europe, anywhere in the world. And you also can get money from there. And much faster, and I guess to uh, uh, the transaction fees, are, or the fees in general, are lower. So how is this even possible? Um, Satoshi Nakamoto used three big areas of uh, science, let's say it that way. The first is cryptography. Cryptography is used for um, having pri privacy, privacy at the same time as transparency, which is important for an open blockchain system. The second one is game theory. From there, he took the ideas to um, how to, to, to mine new Bitcoins and how to decide on the blockchain, which is called proof of work. That's the mining mechanism in the Bitcoin blockchain. And also the so-called peer-to-peer networks are a little bit an idea out of game theory uh, because the Bitcoin blockchain, all transactions from 2009 till today are in this big database. It's actually a database. And there are around 50 or 60,000 computers worldwide at the moment who carry this database. So all of these computers, all these full nodes know the exact, the same transactions and their values. They have the same brain in a way. Um, that you can Im imagine that like a decentralized Google Sheet, you know, when you're putting numbers in a Google Sheet and you're doing that with five other people, you have to decide together what is in the first cell, for instance, you know, like there is a 10, okay, then you decide it's a 10. So everybody has this 10 in his or her Google Sheet. And that's basically also what happens with the Bitcoin blockchain. It's permanently synchronized and so nobody can interfere. That meaning um, if one of these ledgers would be um, interfered with, if, if somebody would change something inside, all the others could see that immediately and kick this server out of the uh, network. So you, you, you're punished for behaving badly, uh, you're pushed out automatically. And now, 
what is a blockchain anyway? Basically, it's a chain of data blocks. Um, the, the, the most important thing to know like about the cryptography and why it's so secure in Bitcoin is that transactions are pulled together in blocks and then uh, there is a, a hashing function that is built from the computer does that, you know. And um, it has to meet a special goal. So that's, in this example, four zeros at the begin. And then when the next block is mined, every 10 minutes, a new block is attached to the Bitcoin blockchain. So new transactions are added to the blockchain. That means as soon as your transaction, if you would send some Bitcoin to somebody else, it needs at last 10 minutes and then it's in the next block. And the magic thing here is that um, these hashing functions build, let's say it's not a sum, but it's, it, um, how shall I say that in English? This number down here represents the content of these blocks. So I have the result of the first block is the number starting with four zeros and then you have a nine in the end. And this is exactly the same here. So you take from the previous block to the next block and this block generates a new hash that's that and it, it, it's included this one. So now everything is transparent and you can see that the block is valid and it's chained to the first one over this hash value, you know? And if, would, if somebody would interfere with this hash value, then the blockchain breaks apart. And then you know somebody has interfered with it and it's not true anymore. So in the next 10 minutes, the next blocks get, block gets added. So, and if somebody would interfere with one in the middle, for instance, then it breaks apart. And as I said before, this node is kicked out of the network because he's a fraud in a way. So that's the so-called mining mechanism. What does it do when you send a transaction to somebody else, like sending me, me, me Bitcoin or I send you Bitcoin? This gets over the internet into the cloud and the miners go and search for transactions they want to include into their blocks. So they put transactions in their blocks and then they start solving this hashing puzzle. So they start, the, 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 the computers and the software starts to find the right hashing value. And the first of these, I don't know how many mining machines there are worldwide, it must be thousands, a hundred thousand. The first one who finds this hash, uh, hash value has solved this so-called mining puzzle and is allowed to attach this block to the chain. Like I said, every 10 minutes there is a new block. And those databases, those full nodes who hold the blockchain, then confirm that so that this miner has worked the right way. And then the miner gets 12.5 Bitcoin. So that's the way how Bitcoin are getting into the world. The miners with mining single blocks get 12.5 Bitcoin for the work they do and to when they are truthful. So if they are trying to fraud, then they won't get the money because they are kicked out, as I said before. And there's an event coming up in the Bitcoin space in May 2020, uh, the halving takes place. Every four years, this amount of new Bitcoins that are mined halves. So in May 2020, it's only 6.25 Bitcoin then. So with these uh, properties, the Bitcoin blockchain or Bitcoin is able to not being seized. As I said before, if you have your private keys, your seed for your wallet, then nobody can take your Bitcoin away. It cannot be manipulated. It cannot be inflated because there is a fixed amount of Bitcoin that is going to be mined. That's 21 million. So there's no central bank with people sitting and deciding, okay, we give out another, we print another um, um, packet of uh, Pula, for instance. Um, 
So it's basically a deflationary uh, currency with a fixed amount of money that there will be in the end. So like I said, it belongs to you if you hold the private keys, the so-called seed. It's like cash in your pocket, basically. It can be used by everyone. You don't need permission for it. And I'd say it's in so-called open blockchain. That's what I said before. It's open, public, transparent, and it's community money. There is no leader, no company behind, no single entity can decide alone what happens with the Bitcoin blockchain. So then I think what very is also very important to know, there are many forms of money um, growing at the moment or coming into existence. And uh, I think the very, the very, very important uh, differentiator here is, is it permissioned or is it permissionless? You know, on the one hand, we have so-called permissioned money because you have the US dollar, the euro, uh, the, the Pula, um, the Zimbabwean dollar. You need a bank account for it. You have to show your ID. You need approvement. And with Bitcoin, you don't have that. And the same goes for Libra, for instance. I mean, Libra would be in a way cool because I think everybody of you is using Facebook. So it would be super to send money immediately over Facebook. But on the other hand, it's a company um, that can decide if they want to shut you out or not, or if a transaction is bad or not. So s you have to ask for permission to be able to use it. And uh, the, the, the Libra Association behind this whole concept of Facebook <coughs> and the first companies already said, okay, no, uh, we face the regulators and they want to push back on us. And so we go out of this consortium. We don't want to be in that anymore. So you see it's PayPal, MasterCard, uh, eBay, Stripe, Visa, they all went out again. So we'll see if this is coming or not. But if it's coming and what it's planned is what you can see here. It's a, a, a scheme of how Libra is working and uh, which parties are in there. So. You would have Calibra, a digital wallet um, that belongs to Facebook, I guess, at the beginning. Then you have the users, then you have authorized distributors, you have the Libra Association, and all this is backed by bank deposits and short-term public debt securities. So from the monetary perspective, this is basically like PayPal, like your credit card, only digital, easier to use but it doesn't solve all the other problems that Bitcoin would solve or what, what Bitcoin enables us. It doesn't do that. So that's the big difference between Bitcoin and, and, and um, Libra, for instance. So what we see right now is the emergence of three forms of money. We have what I call money, money for people, community money, Bitcoin and other open blockchains, for instance, Litecoin, uh, Monero, I would say, Ethereum, but you won't really use Ether to pay your bills. Money by governments that are, are well-known fiat money, uh, national digital currencies will also come now, and money by corporations like Libra or JP Morgan coin. Um, and uh, talking about these national digital currencies, I think that the central banks all over the world will start giving out their own digital currencies because they see Libra, Facebook wants to put on Libra and uh, they don't want that money by states is in the hands of a private company, what I understand. But therefore I think we could have Bitcoin because it's an open common good. Every, nobody owns the network, you know, it's like the email software, like the email protocol, IMAP, SMTP, nobody owns that. Everybody can use it. And that's basically what the Bitcoin blockchain is. So, okay, now I talked a lot about this, but can you really use Bitcoin? And for what? I think, or I'd say, yes, if you're available to stack a little, small amount of Satoshis, like Satoshi is the smallest unit of a Bitcoin, um, then that would be great for the future. 
Um, but you have to see, this to see that all of these cryptocurrencies, you have a high risk of loss, yeah? But I can't tell you that now. I mean, I'm not an, I'm, I don't give you investment advice, uh, but I think the Bitcoin blockchain is very secure, but you have to see that in the long term. It won't be like tomorrow you're rich, you know? And everybody who promises you like 5% a week, a month, or something like that, that's a scam. You cannot promise anybody anything. And if you want to use Bitcoin, you don't have to buy a package or something. You just lo download a wallet and can start using it. Please tell that your friends and your family. That's very important. Everything else yeah, would be permissioned again. You can do cross-border transactions. For instance, if you're a freelancer or a digital entrepreneur and you can do websites, you can be paid by companies outside of the, your country very easily and you would not have to uh, exchange it more than one time and pay high bank fees. It's like cash and uh, you also have transaction fees in the Bitcoin blockchain because the miners have to be paid for their work. And um, so you have transaction fees, but they are based on the data amount and not of the, on the amount of the value you send. So, of course, this ran into some problems in 2017 where you had to pay very high transaction fees on the Bitcoin blockchain. And that's the reason why there is the Lightning Network now where you can do microtransactions also with less fees. And I think that Bitcoin also will become in the coming like 10 years maybe a method of uh, payment. As I said before, uh, with micropayments and uh, the Lightning Network. Now let's take a little look at the development of Bitcoin in the last 10 or almost 11 years now. You see at the beginning nothing happened. Uh, that shows you that it's a grassroots development. Nobody had the money or did want to market it like, like Ripple is marketed, for instance, you know? Um, so people got into it because they were interested in it and they saw that the properties are great. And then from 2014 to 2017, it rose, rose a little bit. And then in 2017, we had that big hype. And um, we are now at uh, like around 9,000 USD is a Bitcoin today. And yeah, we'll see. If you looked at a logarithmic scale of that same uh, graph, you see that actually it's always going up, yeah? But uh, also I say here, I don't want to build here like promises that money, that Bitcoin will always go up. I don't know. So that's what I said before, that will be a maximum of 21 million Bitcoin in the space it's a rule in the Bitcoin protocol. Every 10 minutes, a new block um, is released or is attached to the blockchain. So that means that we have around 18 million Bitcoin at the moment around to use. Somebody holds it, somebody uses it. And in around 2140, um, the last Bitcoin will be released. And then we have those 21 million around. And this is quite an interesting graph it shows you the development of the Bitcoin price in the last years and always after a halving. So the right, uh, the red uh, signs there say halving. So the, the, the red hmm, lines mark the halving. And you can see always after a halving, the price went up. And people expect now here in May 2020, the next halving, and they wish for, that's what we call hopium, like hope and opium, you know, um, that the price is going up then. But we'll see, yeah? But this happens in May 2020. So, can Bitcoin be banned? We have a map on Wikipedia which shows the legal status of Bitcoin. There's nothing in uh, Gaborone, uh, nothing in Botswana. Uh, I think you have no regulation here. And uh, yeah, in most of the countries, it's free to use. We'll see how this develops. But even if a country says, you're not allowed to use Bitcoin, 
Um, there is a satellite network working uh, and it's covering whole of the earth and it sends, it sends the Bitcoin blockchain down to earth. So if you have a satellite receiver and uh, you can download the software and all our instructions, you only need a, a TV dish and the right software, you can receive the Bitcoin blockchain from the satellite so even if you have no internet connection because you're banned or something like that, you can still receive uh, the, the blockchain and uh, uh, verify your own transactions. And there's also a guy uh, from Canada, he sent Bitcoin over the radio, like the, the radio the pilots, pilots use in the airplanes. So it was possible to send Bitcoin from Canada to, I think, mid the mid USA or something. So it's also possible to use Bitcoin without the internet. So nobody actually can shut it down. So um, just a short introduction into the Lightning Network. Uh, as I said before, there are scalability problems on the Bitcoin blockchain. So the, the transaction fee went very high. And um, so micropayments are not really possible on the Bitcoin blockchain and therefore uh, the Lightning Network was invented, let's say it that way. And the differentiation is that you have the Bitcoin blockchain, the protocol as the base layer, and on top of that, the Lightning Network on a so-called second layer, the Lightning Network is working. Um, that's, you can compare it like uh, with the TCP IP protocol in the internet, and on top of that you have the SMTP uh, IMAP uh, SMTP protocol for sending the emails. And that's quite similar. So you, you have an uh, opening transaction that is uh, chained to the Bitcoin blockchain. And then you have lots and lots of payment routes, so-called payment channels. And so in these payment channels, you can send microtransactions. And they are sent only in these nodes, in these payment channels. And then the last um, payment channel is again chained to the Bitcoin blockchain. And that ensures that these Lightning payments are also really settled on the Bitcoin blockchain. So using the Lightning payment uh, network is basically using Bitcoin. Basically, it looks like that you can, it's a scheme, you know, it's not really like how in detail the technology run, runs, but the basic is the internet layer. Then you have the Bitcoin blockchain protocol layer. That's what I was talking about before all the time with Bitcoin as native token. So every blockchain needs a token. As that's the coin in a way uh, to work properly because without uh, money in, in incentive, uh, all the miners would maybe not behave properly. They would do what they want uh, to enrich themselves. So you need this mining mechanism, this proof of work. And on top of that, we now have the Lightning Network. Um, I show you wallets afterwards with which you can use that already. And uh, we have so-called side chains like RSK or Elements. I think uh, um, Alakanani is already working with RSK. Yeah, great. It's basically very similar to Ethereum. So you don't need Ethereum actually anymore to do smart contracts or other kind of programmable stuff you do on uh, Bitcoin. You can do it now on Bitcoin too. And uh, this is quite something, I think. And um, then you also have the liquid network from a company called Blockstream, where you also can uh, have tokens and assets and other forms of digital collectibles that are forms of tokens they are, yeah, kind of similar like, bit, like Bitcoin, but they might not be used as Bitcoin, like a money, a real money that we want to use to buy stuff. What I said before was that with the Lightning Network, it's possible to send microtransactions. So there is a tool, for instance, called Tipping Me. So imagine you're a content producer you're writing texts for somebody or you're twittering stuff and people want to pay you for that. So today you would need a credit card company, any kind of interface like you buy on a webshop stuff, you need something like that 
to pay me for a tweet, for instance. But now we have the tip in me uh, software that's built on top of the Lightning Network. And you can, if you use your desktop computer, basically send me money just through your Lightning Wallet. So when uh, you install the tip in me extension on the Chrome browser or on Firefox, for instance, you open Twitter. And as soon as you've installed that, there is a tip in me button. It's a flash sign, yeah. The flash sign stands for the Lightning Network. Super, okay. What I want to show you is how you can pay someone over the internet without any borders, because it's very, very easy, basically. So like me, I'm on Twitter. I have an account at tipping me, yeah? So with my tipping me account, uh, as soon as I have made that, because it's connected to Twitter, Twitter knows, okay, Anita can be paid via Lightning over this button. So if I'm like you and I want to send me money, I click on that button, then my tipping me address, it's like a Bitcoin address, but it's only Lightning, I can see it. Then I open my Lightning wallet, because at the moment there are Bitcoin wallets and Lightning wallets, you know, it's like we have the base layer and layer one, and we have different wallets for it. But this will change soon. The, the Phoenix wallet, I'll show you afterwards, is already able to use both networks in one wallet, and that's how the future will be. So that's my address. Um, imagine that's your wallet, you want to send me money. So I, I press the send button here, so the camera comes up, I scan the QR code, uh, I confirm now. So and now I can send, for instance, 50 sats, that would be, no I do more because then, so 50 sa 500 satoshis, which is the smallest, uh, Mm, unit in Bitcoin, it's a hundred million still of a Bitcoin, um, that's about 0.04 euro cents or US dollar cents, that would be 0 0.004 Pula. I can send that now to me and I say pay. So it's processing and and sent. So the money is in my tipping me account now. So and that's it. That's paying over lightning on the internet everywhere worldwide. You only need a wallet with a little money on it, Bitcoin wallet or in that case a lightning wallet. You can have a Twitter account. You write great stories or something. You install the tip in me. It's frictionless. You don't have to ask anyone, you don't need to wait long, and it's with very small amounts. That's one of the ways that maybe content producers might be paid in the future. Because at the moment, if you produce content on the internet, you're basically doing it for free because if you're not a big media company, how do you want to earn money from it, you know? But this would be a way that small people like me or you can earn Bitcoin over the internet. And there's a second thing how you could earn called stack work. The basics are that um, you get a login for this system and then you can earn lightning satoshis for small jobs, you know, like click work. So you get an image for, from a uh, grocery, you know, the, on the back side you have these things where it says how much fat, how much carbohydrates and stuff is in there. And they ask you how much uh, sodium is in there. And then you read it and you put in the number, the correct number. Then you confirm and that's the task. And with that you've earned some satoshis. And then you have many of these tasks you can do this for, for a little time every day and uh, can earn satoshis. You can pay out these satoshis. Actually the same way as I just showed you how to pay. And um, you just need the allowance to use this to get verified and a lightning uh, wallet to pay it out or you can pay it out over Bitrefill for instance. Bitrefill, I don't know if you know it, is uh, a website where you can buy 
airtime for your smartphones, for instance, uh, at Orange, what do you have, Mascom and Be Mobile. So you could like earn the Bitcoin, the Lightning Bitcoin on this stackwork thing and immediately send it to Bitrefill and they fill up your phone. So that's a way, because many people say, okay, then I have maybe Bitcoin, but what do I do with them? I can't spend them here. I can't buy groceries. I can't buy, I can't pay my rent with it. So that would be a possibility. If you earn Bitcoin over the internet, you could cash it out in airtime. That's one of the ways. And uh, I mean, I hope or there might be a real Bitcoin ecosystem coming up because when people learn how to use it and how, to, how great it is, they will want to have it. They, want, they will want to use it because it's so much easier and frictionless and nobody can take it away from you. So that's one of the ways how you could earn some Satoshis. So what do you need if you want to start that? If you want to uh, earn Bitcoin over tipping me, for instance, or to do the stack work, you need a lightning wallet. Mm, Phoenix is the wallet I use, for instance. If you have an Android phone, you can use this wallet. It's very easy to use. And basically you could use, you use it to, you can use on the Bitcoin block, send on the Bitcoin blockchain and on the Lightning Network, which is very great. And I think that's the future of the Bitcoin wallets. And if you have an iPhone, I was told that Breeze is a great wallet. I have never used it myself because I don't have an iPhone. But these are recommended wallets. And now I take a step back to recommend you some Bitcoin wallets, as we said, for the, the bigger um, amounts you can send. And what is a Bitcoin wallet anyhow? And uh, because mistakenly, some people explain it like it's a wallet, like your, your purse, you know, and in your purse you have coins and paper money. But the Bitcoin wallet, you don't have Bitcoin in the wallet. You only have the keys to the wallet. It's like a, a, a keychain, you know? It's like at, at home, you might have a, a place where you put your keys and um, that's basically the wallet. It gives you the private keys to your Bitcoin addresses. And it's important that you use a so-called non-custodial wallet. That is a wallet that's really on your smartphone and you have the private keys, the seed for it. Uh, it's a so-called mnemonic seed, or you can also say a recovery phrase, and it tells you in the wallet, most of the times there's a button called backup, backup your wallet or something, and then it shows you 24 English words, and these you should write down. And if you be able, are able, and you should be able to keep this paper, then you all the time have access to your Bitcoin. And um, I mean, I, I always in Europe, I say the analogy is like in your purse, the money you have in your purse should be the same amount on your smartphone. So if you lose your smartphone, then only the amount is lost that was in your, would also be in your purse, like a small amount. If you have larger amounts of money, like having it in a bank, ac a bank account similarly, I would use a hardware wallet or the card wallet. And I know you don't get that here. That's a problem. Uh, so I brought some. But uh, I hope in the future that you also will be able to use these tools. So there are different forms of wallets. You can have it on your desktop or your laptop computer. Most times you will have it on your smartphone. And as I said before, for bigger amounts, a hardware wallet because it's more secure. If you want to use Bitcoin BTC, and I'm always talking about B BTC here in this uh, seminar, um, then I recommend the Blockstream Green Wallet. It's for Android and iOS. It's a very easy to use wallet and very secure, I would say. If you also want to use other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, Litecoin, uh, Monero, whatever, you can use the Edge wallet. I also use this one. Uh, and it's also for Android and Apple uh, iPhones. And for the guys who are interested in more privacy, uh, the Samurai wallet is the right thing. Uh, it's only on Android and it's, it's doing so-called coin joins. 
It's an inbuilt mixer actually in the uh, wallet um, and um, that, that uh, gives you more privacy. So now, um, this is what I brought, one of those. Uh, it's the so-called Bitbox O2 by the company that's sponsoring me, Shift Crypto Security. It's a so-called hardware wallet. And the special thing about a hardware wallet is it's a little device, basically similar to a USB stick, and there your private keys are stored only on this device. And you can connect it with your computer, but it never touches your computer in, in that case. I mean, the, if you have a virus, for instance, on your computer, it can't go through. And nobody can remotely um, use it because there's no connection in between. And you have to press the hardware wallet to confirm transactions. So that's why it's so secure. And um, with a hardware wallet, you can do regular transactions also. Um, this one you can also connect with your smartphone. And this is a new kind of a thing. Uh, it's a, I have, I have a, an example here. I can show you just that you see. This is a so-called card wallet. It's basically a plastic card, like a credit card, for instance. And, oops, <laughs> and it has a Bitcoin address on it. And on the back, now you can't see it because it's hidden. It's, it should be a secret. Are the private keys to get your Bitcoin from this wallet again. So the great thing about this is it's never connected to the internet, so nobody can hack it or something like that. You can put it, you have to put it in a safe place so nobody steals it because as soon as somebody else has this and scratches it up, the person can get your money. But you don't need software for it, so that's very, how, how do you say in English, do you say practic practical? So it's easy, easy to use if you don't want to keep your software updates because with the hardware wallet you need a software and this is without software. So I mean, if you are familiar with paper wallets, that's basically a paper wallet but in, a, in another, in a more secure form. I can give this around, you can take a look at it. I have, I have two of those here and I will give it away afterwards. So, to summarize this, if you want to start earning or getting Bitcoin, you should look out for one of the wallets I just told you. Uh, there are many exchanges in Europe and in the US, and I think maybe you know Paxful, that's a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, um, but Coinbase or Kraken or Poloniex, I don't know if you're familiar with that, I don't think so they basically have so-called custodial wallets for you. So if you buy Bitcoin there or exchange it, you get a custodial wallet, meaning you don't have the seed, you don't have the private keys to your Bitcoin. And there's a slogan, it says, not your keys, not your coins. And basically that is what meant with that. Those Kraken, Poloniex, Coinbase, these are basically banks again. So they care for your money and if they go down or if they close or whatever, it's not permissionless anymore, you know? So you should have your own key. So you can earn Bitcoin like the way I, I said before. You can exchange in person. Um, you cannot use local Bitcoin, sorry for that at the moment. There's another peer-to-peer -peer exchange which should be working actually, it's called hodlhodl.com. Hodl means actually hold and it's a joke because somebody misspelled it once and since then it's called hodl, hodling. And in the early days you could also mine Bitcoin but these days are gone now, you need lots of electricity for it and uh, supercomputers in a way. So if you, if you um, I'm not completely at the end but just uh, in between a little hint on Bitcoin education material. Um, for instance, there's a very good book if you're a developer and in inter interested in the basics how to uh, program Bitcoin and to learn that. Uh, Mastering Bitcoin is a great book. I put in the link, you get the presentation afterwards. 
It's um, usually you can only buy it, but Andreas also has a version on it on GitHub, so you can read it for free. Uh, there's another book from a guy called Jimmy Song. It's called Programming Bitcoin. Um, that he also has a GitHub page. And yes, um, Andreas Antonopoulos in every form, he's a great uh, educator and explainer. Then on lop.net, you find a lot of information, educational information for free. Then, okay, my own podcast, yes, uh, please subscribe to it. I need followers. Because the more followers I have, have, the better I can tell my sponsors, look, so many people listen to my podcast and then I can earn a little money again to go around the world and do this, what I do here. And th this is also very recommended. I did that too. It's a free open online course on the University of U Nicosia. I think they have it two times a year. Um, and you learn the basics of cryptocurrency. And it's v really a very good course. It's with Andreas Antonopoulos also. And it's free. It doesn't cost you a thing. You only need internet. So if you would like to set up a Bitcoin wallet now, as I said before, you have to write down your own seed on a piece of paper. Don't, don't store it on your phone. Don't make a, co a picture of it. That's, that can be stolen. Just put it on paper. So for instance, with the Blockstream Green Wallet, you can download it on the Apple Store or Android Store. And then you create a new wallet and it tells you also to write down the words uh, and, and uh, store it in a safe place. And write it down in the correct order. That's also um, important. So basically, that's an example of a Bitcoin address uh, it's um, yeah, numbers and letters in a row and you have a QR code that um, is the similar thing and I could like for instance let's try to uh, send some money to this address that's my address so don't send money there <laughs> I mean yes send money if you have some but <laughs> I really, I have an example of an address in my book and somebody sent me money and I don't know if this person, I don't know who it is, you, you don't know who it is. And I don't know if this person just wanted to test it and uh, they, he, she really sent me money. So, yeah. So, okay, so I open my wallet. I have the Edge wallet because I also have a little bit of Ether and Litecoin and Monero, but actually, to be honest, I only use Bitcoin. At the beginning, when I got into the Bitcoin space, I thought, okay, all the other stuff is interesting too. But actually for, for using it as a money and um, as a medium uh, of exchange, as a store of value, I think BTC is the only way to go. That's my personal uh, opinion. Okay, now I say send. Now we have this thing again. Let's see if it can, yes, have you seen it? Uh, now this address, I have the address here in my um, screen, on my screen. So let's look if it does one euro. Yeah, sure. I mean, I can send two euros. That's two euros is 20 Pula. Uh, it yeah. Okay. And you can see there is a fee. As I said before, you have to pay a transaction fee for the miners. But I can, um, in this wallet, I can decide on ha how high I want the fee. So if I pay more, then my transaction is faster, uh, in, uh, will, be <laughs> will be confirmed faster because the miners can select which transactions they want to mine. And of course, they take the ones where there is a higher transaction fee on it. So they earn more money with it. So. I could change that here now, but now for now I, I let it and I could also say I want to use less, then it might only arrive in one day. But if that's okay for me, then I paid less transaction fee. So now I just uh, slide to confirm this and my transaction has been successfully sent. And um, now I could look into the Bitcoin blockchain if it's already confirmed, because as I said before, every 10 minutes a block is uh, added to the blockchain. That means it will take at least 10 minutes until this payment is in my wallet, in my other wallet. Um, and that's the great thing about the Lightning Network. It goes instantly. So 
we can actually, which address is this? Um, wait a moment. Let's look in the blockchain explorer because you then have so-called blockchain explore explorer where, can, where you can look up uh, Bitcoin addresses. And that's the thing why Bitcoin is not anonymous, but pseudonymous. Um, everybody can see how much money is on an address. Um, this, is, this is the example address. And there you see such a blockchain explorer. It's basically like a search engine for Bitcoin, yeah? looking for transactions. You can see inputs, outputs, value transacted and stuff. And I have basically the same here now for the payments I just did. And it says unconfirmed. So my payment is at the moment in the cloud, as I told you before, it's in the so-called mempool. And it's waiting for miners who take it and mine it into these blocks. So, and as soon as uh, my transaction is in one of these blocks added to the blockchain, I see here confirmed and then I know it's settled, it's done. It cannot be interfered with nothing. Yeah? So it's forever on the blockchain. So as I said before, my <laughs> podcast is on all the major podcast platforms. Um, I also have a Telegram group, uh, especially for people in Zimbabwe and Botswana. I founded that the last week. So if you join me there in this Telegram group, I can answer your questions uh, if you want. And I'm also on Twitter. Thank you.